Humanity's ability to move people, goods, and ideas has shaped the rise and fall of civilizations for millennia. It all started, arguably, with the most important invention in transportation. The creation of the wheel by the Mesopotamians back in 3500 BC. Originally created for wheel-thrown pottery, the wheel would eventually find itself being used in carts to help transport goods and people. The Mesopotamians got things rolling with the wheel, but transportation technology has continued to evolve. Early innovations have aided in the creation and destruction of empires. Modern innovations have shaped cities and the people who live in them. How will the continued evolution of transportation change how our world looks in the future? It's time to hit the road and explore the past, present, and future of transportation. Around the same time the wheel got rolling, Mesopotamians and Egyptians were transporting people and goods using wooden riverboats. This innovation allowed for thriving cities to grow and develop near powerful flowing water sources. Years later, in 2000 BCE, the Egyptians would take their knowledge of assembling wood planks into ships' hulls and get the credit with the invention of the earliest ships. They used woven straps to bind the planks together and stuffed reeds or grass in between them to seal the seams. While the seas were opening up, back on land, another very important moment was happening, the domestication of horses. The scientific evidence is clear. Tamed horses have been a part of human culture for thousands of years. Scientists uncovered horse bones in human graves, and throughout history, there have been many depictions of horses as symbols of power on human artifacts. But around 2500 to 2000 BCE, there were measurable changes in horse size and variability. These kinds of changes usually indicate an animal's domestication and its shifting position in human society. The domestication of horses was a crucial reason for the rise of the legendary Hittite Empire. Based in their fortified capital of Hattusa, about 130 miles east of Ankara, Turkey today, the Hittites rose to regional dominance because of their mastery of the war chariot. The earliest chariots appeared in Mesopotamia around 3000 BC. They were very different from the familiar horse-drawn vehicles seen in ancient Greece and Rome. Early prototypes often had four solid wheels, and their main purpose was for use in parades and funerary rites. These early vehicles were not pulled by horses, but rather by oxen, donkeys, or mules. Under the reign of King Supiluliuma I, the Hittite Empire expanded its borders. Supiliuma had yearned for Hittite supremacy. This drove the king to invest in a large number of horses, and most importantly, the services of a leading horse master, Kikuli. Kikuli developed the first recorded plan for training and caring for horses around 1345 BCE. These Kikuli texts preserved his seven-month training regimen on four clay cuneiform tablets. Thanks to Kikuli's horse training techniques, Hittite charioteers created an empire that stretched across the land known today as Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, and northern Iraq. Many of Kikuli's training methods are still considered effective today. During the 14th century BCE, they allowed the Hittites to become a mighty power. A close and powerful rival, the Egyptians, threatened their empire. In order to deal with this threat, the Hittites developed the lightest and fastest war chariots in the world. Horse-led war chariots made it possible to mount rapid surprise attacks, playing a key role in the establishment of Hittite regional supremacy. Horses remained the cornerstone of human transportation for thousands of years. But just like an old cobblestone road, the transition from a horse-powered society to one ruled by combustion engines was far from smooth. Up until the 19th century, the horse was pretty much a status animal signifying pure wealth. Only the richest people could afford horses, and they used them for personal transportation. Everyone else, they just walked. Occasionally, for longer trips, a dependable ox would get hooked up to a wagon, but cities at the time weren't much wider than two miles and very walkable. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that the horse gained the status of a living machine. After all, horses were strong and could move things in all the places a heavy steam locomotive couldn't go. Most importantly, horses were adept at handling the real thorn in the side of 19th century transportation, terrible roads. As industrialists of the 
the era continued to develop more ports and railroads, they hired more and more living machines to move goods and workers. The horse and all the small businesses that supported the animal became the backbone of 19th century life. Given the animal's important role, horse populations went through the roof. By 1900, more than 24 million were being used to plow fields, pull street trolleys, brewery wagons, city vehicles, omnibuses, and carriages. As horses labored in cities and agriculture, their skill created other social challenges. An urban workhorse dumped between 20 to 50 pounds of manure a day onto the street, along with a gallon of urine. 35 pounds of manure plus one gallon of urine times 500 horses per square mile equals one very, very big mess. Some cities had decent systems for trucking out the manure. Others just tossed it in the river. All that manure was pounded and pulverized into dust, which attracts rodents and flies. Estimates were that 95% of all disease-carrying flies bred in horse dung. Faced with massive influxes of immigrants, political unrest, and factory pollution, the professional class of North American industrial cities had decided that public spaces had become too chaotic. This led to the rise of a new urban reformer dedicated to the thorough sanitizing of city streets with new advanced technologies. The large urban workhorse, along with its flies and smells, was an undeniable element of the chaotic city environment. Both urban reformers and public health officials vilified the horse and championed the automobile and the electric trolley. Many even went as far as to predict that cars would actually clean up city streets, reducing congestion and restoring order to the city. Magazines at the turn of the century promised in print that removing horses from cities would not only reduce noise, but also save money. Pro-car propaganda was in full swing. After that, it took more than 50 years for the horse and the farm to be completely removed from urban life. Spoiler alert, the transition didn't end the chaos in cities. The rise of the car compounded old urban issues. Cars didn't clean up cities. Static, smelly piles of dung were replaced with invisible, wafting clouds of air pollution. The automobile allowed the rich and middle class to abandon public transit altogether. Street contact between the well-to-do and the working poor was minimized. The rise of the car also made walking the most democratic and efficient form of transportation a lower class activity. The roads didn't even get safer. The rise of the automobile also accelerated oil spending and played a major role in hitting the atmosphere with greenhouse gas emissions. The transition also drove down the price of grain so drastically that the US Census Bureau called it one of the main contributing factors to the Great Depression. Even with expanded road infrastructure, ironically, it didn't take long for millions of cheap cars to clog urban thoroughfares so completely Completely, that they moved as slowly as horses. The roads were dominated by car makers and oil companies. This, in turn, led to the growth of big government investment in the development of more roads to accommodate more cars. In the summer of 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower approved funding for the construction of the United States Interstate Highway System. The development of a uniform system of roads, bridges, and tunnels would go on to change the face of the country. President Eisenhower was motivated to create a uniform highway network in large part because of his time as a military observer to the first transcontinental motor convoy. The first transcontinental motor convoy was an unprecedented military experiment that was essentially a road test for military vehicles. It was used to identify the challenges in moving troops from coast to coast with existing infrastructure. The excursion covered 3,200 miles from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. It included 79 vehicles of all sizes and 297 personnel. During the expedition, Eisenhower gained a lot of insight into the poor conditions of the nation's existing transportation infrastructure. He reported a mix of paved and unpaved roads, old bridges, and narrow passages. Years later, after seeing how the advanced European highway system helped the Allies efficiently resupply forces during World War II, the improvement of the road infrastructure became a 
presidential priority. On September 12, 1991, Interstate 90 between Seattle, Washington and Boston, Massachusetts became the final coast-to-coast -coast interstate highway completed. Today, the interstate system consists of over 47,000 miles of highways. The final cost of construction, adjusted for inflation, is over 500 billion. The miles and miles of interstate highway were a blessing for rural communities, but in many ways, they were a curse for cities. Powerful industry interest groups, a lack of foresight, and institutionalized racism aided in the development of highways and the destruction of communities. Highway development was often cited as the justification for the tearing down of predominantly black, lower-income urban communities. The ones that survived the shift were often left incredibly isolated. The changes sent wealthy city dwellers running to the suburbs, using the highways to commute back in by car. Cars, trucks, and highways have had an undeniable impact on how cities are structured. Now, faced with the resulting traffic and environmental costs of a car-centric society, it's clear that we need to rethink the future of transportation. One major draw to life in the cities are the conveniences. But everyday conveniences like next-day shipping and food delivery also contribute to heavy congestion and pollution. One potential solution on the horizon is the use of automated drones to deliver important important things like mozzarella sticks and cheese fries? There are several logistical concerns with having that much dairy airborne, but these electric AI-controlled flying drones are already in operation in limited markets. With many major delivery players heavily invested, only time will tell if these kinds of aerial innovations make a meaningful impact on street traffic and pollution. Solar or electrical-powered cars represent a very attractive solution to congested and polluted cities. They allow for the continued use of existing roads without burning the same fuel. Self-driving cars promise a similar sense of individual mobility to the original rise of the automobile. These alternative powered cars also represent some of the most technologically advanced vehicles to hit city streets. One key benefit of these advanced vehicles are the powerful self-driving capabilities. Car manufacturers have promised us a safer, more predictable, less congested future Future, as future cars will communicate with each other, minimizing accidents. Car hail apps like Uber and Lyft are banking on a future where their entire fleets are controlled by completely autonomous systems, lowering their overhead and making their incredibly large fleets of transportation and delivery vehicles much more profitable. But the future of fully automated transportation isn't only limited to the ground, there's also plenty of potential room for travel overhead literally. A very cool alternative to sitting in traffic is flying over it. The wealthy already do it. Taking a helicopter to the airport or a 15-minute flight on a private jet to beat California traffic has long been an option for the rich and impatient. But we're potentially heading towards a future where escaping traffic by flying over it will become a solution for more than just the mega-rich. The future of low-altitude personal transportation? Drones. Fully autonomous advanced passenger drones that are large enough to transport goods or people through the air. There are different types of passenger drones, but the vertical takeoff and landing variety would be perfect for traveling from building to building in a dense and crowded city. Most contemporary passenger drones are still piloted by humans, with some, if any, support from AI systems. But fully automated AI models are just around the corner. Just as with cars, fully automated passenger drones will undoubtedly have a huge impact and unforeseen consequences on life in urban environments. The wealthy already get to bend space and time to their will by flying in helicopters and private jets. They're getting to see and do more as they spend less of their lives stuck in traffic. Or at the very least, they don't have to live near a highway, inhaling all the exhaust and smog. Passenger drones may be the flying cars we were promised, but what will opening up urban airways for fast travel mean for city life? Is a future where upwardly mobile urban professionals get to dart from rooftop bar to rooftop bar without ever having to see a transient homeless or displaced person a utopian one? Will the next major shift in transportation resolve some of the mistakes we created with quick technological fixes in the past. Only time will tell.
For more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to this channel right now and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look for CuriosityStream on social media. Links in the description.